Hi guys, it's me, John Taylor again. Um, this is Ezra's Eagle chapter 15. I say Ezra's Eagle, but really it's just Ezra. I keep Ezra's Eagle for continuity, but this is just chapter 15. This chapter is a long chapter, but it is absolutely incredible uh, what we learn, what Ezra sees here. Um, we're gonna learn what, what warning does the Lord give to the world via Ezra? What is this smoke that he saw here in America? Um, what happens to China and Asia? Which uh, I've had a lot of people ask, you know, how come there's no prophecies talking about them and what's going to happen to them? Because clearly they have wickedness there as well. This covers that. There is a vision in this chapter covering that. And then what is the nature of this great army in the Middle East? Um, this is a pretty heavy chapter. It's full of doom and gloom and fear, but it's not the fear that you would think. This is um, a fear that the wicked should have um, because this talks a lot about their destruction and our rescue. Um, I, was a, I served as a, an ecclesiastical leader for my church and I had a, a, a sister come in and uh, she was really studying a lot of these end times prophecies and she was really scared and really concerned and afraid and um that is not where we should be at when we read end time prophecy we are counseled to not be afraid to not fear to not fear the antichrist or the assyrian we are counseled to um develop confidence in our savior and um as we exercise our faith as we grow closer spiritually to our heavenly father that confidence will grow in us so when we read these horrible visions these this great and terrible day of the lord we're not afraid of it we are actually excited and welcome it and we will be at a point where we are pretty beleaguered saints just like joseph smith you know, where we are just tired of persecution and unfairness and we are just ready to be rescued. And so these visions, we look forward with optimism. So let's move on to the next slide. All right. As always, I would just encourage you to read this chapter 15 first, just so that you have a background context of what we're going to cover. Okay, starting off, behold, speak thou in the ears of my people the words of prophecy, which I will put in thy mouth, saith the Lord. Now remember, the Lord is talking to Ezra. The, the Ezra's eagle vision, and then chapters 12 and 13, and then chapter 14 vision, which was incredible if you haven't seen my previous presentation. Um, the Lord is still counseling and showing Ezra a lot of things. And in this verse, you know, it's interesting. Rejection is hard and the Lord's comforting Ezra. It's hard for all of us. And we sometimes hesitate to open our mouths because of the fear of rejection. However, Ezra has been given further light and knowledge and is accountable to speak the mind and will of the Lord. So remember, his words become a double edged sword for the benefit or condemnation of men. The faithful who refuse to hear or listen or soften their hearts, they will die being unfaithful. Um, so in the afterlife, when they finally begin to recognize their folly, this regret has been described uh, from some as weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. This is a suffering restitution that has to take place for them. And eventually they will learn and accept the truth and be able to receive a degree of glory. But their pathway is a not very fun pathway. And it's possible that they can receive a telestial, maybe a terrestrial degree of glory. And who knows, maybe some of them can make a full restitution and change and receive the celestial degree of glory. I like to have hope even for the most hopeless. 
And really the Lord knows the level of our accountability. Ezra is bringing accountability to the wicked and the righteous. We, when we open our mouths, are bringing accountability to the wicked and the righteous. Okay, um, verse 2. And cause them to be written in paper, for they are faithful and true. Fear not the imaginations against thee. Let not the incredulity of them trouble thee and speak against thee. For all the unfaithful shall die in their unfaithfulness. So we just covered that. Let's go to verse 5. Behold, saith the Lord, I will bring plagues upon the world, the sword, famine, death, and destruction. Um, so many unbelievers don't see the plagues happening right now. It's almost a daily occurrence. Earthquakes, floods, droughts, tornadoes, record heat and cold, insects, plagues, COVID pandemic. I mean, this might be a shock um, for you to hear me say this, but I do believe that global climate change is man-made, but not for the reasons the world believes. I don't blame SUVs or coal or cows. I blame godlessness, abortion, the subversion of our agency. For, I blame these things for the global maladies that we are seeing. The cause of calamities is due to our wickedness. And we are becoming a very wicked people on earth. Yes, it is man-made. But normalcy bias continues to settle in. It gets worse and worse and worse. And we just tend to think it's always been that way. Or, you know, we don't see the growing <laughs> or the worsening. I remember people saying, oh, 2020 was horrible. I can't wait till 2021. Well, the prophet says, hold on to your seatbelt and wait till the next year and the next year and the next year. But he was looking at it optimistically because of the revelations that would be coming. So if we continue to be oblivious and we are oblivious right up until our own <laughs> destruction, the reality is when men's hearts are hardened then the only way to be humbled and hopefully turn toward God is by force. I've, oh, I've said this about family members. I said this is a forcible humbling that is taking place right now for a purpose. The Lord is preaching his sermons in the elements. Will we turn toward him or away from him? And at what point will we finally be humbled enough to turn towards him. I've said it in previous presentations. I'll say it again. There are no atheists in a foxhole. When it gets so bad, you turn towards God and you are praying for a rescue. All right, um, verse six. For wickedness hath exceedingly polluted the whole earth and their hurtful works are fulfilled. So when it says their hurtful works are fulfilled, this hints to the wicked being fully ripened for destruction. So this is referring to the very end game of this timeline where the wheat and the tares have grown together now. And now is the time for the judgments of God to be poured out upon men. Just remember, these judgments have begun. The woman is beginning her transitional labor pains. If you don't see it, I don't know what else to tell you. If you're blind, if we don't recognize it, and I know you who are watching this presentation are the ones following this. And when you talk to family members and others about these things, you're like a crazy person. You're like a doomsday or whatever. Uh, don't, don't be frustrated by that. People will eventually come to know and see at a certain point when they decide to. Um, verse 7 and 8, 7 says, Therefore saith the Lord, I will hold my tongue no more as touching their wickedness, which they profanely commit. Neither will I suffer them in those things in which they wickedly exercise themselves. Behold, the innocent and righteous blood crieth unto me, and the souls of the just complain continually. So, after the time 
of the three eagle heads that we've discussed in my first presentation and then the antichrist the lord will no longer suffer the righteous to be abused he's had enough the lord's judgments will be swift after this crucible period that we go through this refining period that the saints go through this seems scary but you'll find peace and confidence through it especially as you trust and have confidence in your savior just remember the prophet joseph smith he faced many scary things i mean everybody was after him and persecuting him but he was not scared because of his knowledge and his confidence and faith in the lord our current prophet is pleading for us to do this spiritual preparation now so that we can have this confidence so that we can endure our trial well so when the just and righteous are abused basically this stands as testimony against evil this justifies what the lord will eventually do to the wicked all right so verse 9 and therefore saith the lord i will surely avenge them there's no doubt it's going to happen and receive unto me all the innocent blood from among them so the lord is going to avenge them being the righteous us um vengeance is his he is basically the judge jury and frankly the executioner so our challenge as as saints as you know uh, good christians is to not let our hatred build for our abusers <laughs> this is going to be hard but this is the challenge you can't let contention and hatred canker your soul you have to endure it in humility you have to suffer it well so instead we've got to let love grow and it will come to the point as our knowledge increases that we will feel deep sorrow and concern for the tremendous mistakes that these oppressors are making and the consequences that they will be experiencing it will be a point that you would not wish this upon your worst enemy um their final state and outcome and the suffering that they go through that is suffering is equal to even as jesus christ suffered who trembled from and bled from every poor i mean people will go through a very painful own atonement if they don't take advantage of the savior's atonement so when we fully comprehend their mistakes we just do not want wish this upon them so you look over here Here's the great volcano that just happened in the ocean. Here's the Colorado fire. Here's tornadoes back east, um, even into December. Here's locusts and plagues. These images are, are showing you the preaching from the Lord that's going on now. Next slide here. Okay, verse 10. Behold, my people is led as a flock to the slaughter. I will not suffer them now to dwell in the land of Egypt so think of think of when the Christ was led to the slaughter and even Joseph Smith taking the Carthage jail being led to the slaughter and so many scriptural accounts here so when it says my people this is referring to those who have accepted Christ and are being persecuted we've made a conscious decision we've got the seal of God on our forehead we are being persecuted by the wicked so remember that christians here in america are his people but the gospel will soon be taken to the jews they will have two prophets stand up and protect them until the very end and those good jewish saints are his people as well there's also many muslims and chinese um, if you haven't read or been studying they've been having dreams they've been being converted to christianity the Lord's work will go forth. Everybody will have the opportunity to, to accept or reject Christianity. And these people in these countries, even now, are being persecuted, even unto death because of their faith. This is happening now. Is Muslim countries in China, um, people are disappearing. North Korea, 
you're seeing this stuff. So however, this verse here gives a big clue as to what location and which group of people he is talking to when it references Egypt. So let's look for verse 11. But I will bring them with a mighty hand and a stretched out arm and smite Egypt with plagues as before and will destroy all the land thereof. So the house of Israel, we know that they were in bondage to Egypt and the Lord sent Moses to deliver them. So Egypt was the oppressor then. And now when the Lord talks about Egypt here, he is referring to the oppressor which will be the Antichrist and all those he influenced in all his armies. So modern day Egypt are those who persecute and abuse the righteous Israelis and converted Christian Muslims of that region. And the other reason we know that this is modern Egypt type of people is because of the verbiage that says, and smite Egypt with plagues as before. So the Lord isn't talking about ancient Egypt here. His, he is talking about future Egypt um, at this time, our people of this time that are wicked. And it's not referring uh, to the country of Egypt, but instead of those wicked who subscribe to the very same satanic motivation as the Egyptians of old. Okay, so the Lord says, he will bring them, meaning plagues, with a mighty hand and outstretched arms, just like the plagues of old. This means that his mighty, you know, by his mighty power, he will bring the plagues upon the wicked persecutors surrounding Israel. I believe the two prophets that stand up in Israel, they will be like Moses, and they will bring these plagues upon this wicked uh, group here. All right, so verse 12, Egypt shall mourn, that's the wicked Egypt, they shall mourn, and the foundation of it shall be smitten with the plague and punishment that God will bring upon it. So this is just meaning the wicked mourn because its foundations is smitten. It no longer has legs to stand on. It will be punished, it will be rebuked, it will be destroyed just like Egypt of old. All right, verse 13. They that till the ground shall mourn, for their seed shall fail through the blasting of hell and with fearful constellation. So it's interesting. This reverts back to how some of the plagues will be. And it mentions two very specific events here. It talks about the blasting of hell that destroys seeds and crops. And, but then it, it adds the fearful constellation language. So I've got some images here of some hail or type of hail. So here's just some food for thought. Hail can be ice and snow, but a hail that burned like fire on the ground could also be meteorite dust raining upon the ground. So our definition, our understanding of hail is as, is as of ice and snow, but that isn't necessarily the correct and accurate definition as they knew it and described it and translated it. So when it says a fearful constellation, that almost hints to something in the heavens, such as a great meteor or, me or comet or meteorite fragments or the a planet or the city of Enoch. I don't know. There's a lot of possibilities. I'm not going to tell you exactly what this is, but it may be that we will just know when we see it. Okay. Um, verse 14, woe to the world and them that dwell therein. So now we are talking about the entire world and all its people. The Lord is saying, woe to the world. This is a global work. There is a global wickedness. We are globally corrupt. And just remember the three eagle heads and the Antichrist are leading now in a global manner with global influence. So the woe is directed to all the wicked of the world that have subscribed to the flatteries and per persuasion of the Antichrist. And they have chosen wickedness and they are ripened for destruction. 
Verse 15, the sword and their destruction draweth nigh, and one people shall stand up and fight against another, and swords in their hands. So one people stand up, fight against another. This in general means war between countries. This is sometimes how God punishes the wicked. He has them fight and kill each other. But many times we overlook that this is also going to be infighting. It's civil wars because of racism or whatever. There's, when there's a contention and everyone is offended and everyone is so full of hate and violence ensues and rage ensues and it continues and continues and continues. So we've already seen neighbors physically fighting with neighbors. We've seen rioting, we've seen looting, blatant disregard for life and property on a scale that we have never seen before. Um, you look at just some of these images. I mean, you can pull up thousands and thousands of images. These images, however, are um, periodic instances. There's a lot of them, but they're periodic instances. But what we're talking about here is a grand scale chaos, pandemonium, uh, mayhem going on here. All right, so verse 16, for there shall be sedition among men and invading one another. They shall not regard their kings nor princes and the course of their actions shall stand in their power. All right, so there shall be sedition among men. That means people in all countries no longer regard nor give credibility to their government. They will openly rebel. They are tired, they're frustrated with the government, everything everybody else so sedition sedition just means the overt conduct you know such as speech or organizing uh, that tends towards rebellion against the established order so it's kind of like a subversion of a constitution our constitution is trying to be subverted we can see it everywhere when it says the course of their actions shall stand in their power this is telling us uh, that the course of the action they take will not be able to be stopped. They will do what they want and will accomplish their goals. This is all the wicked. Whatever they want to do, they can do. They want to run into a grocery store and steal everything. They'll just go in and do it and nobody will stop them. So we see this happening all over. People are becoming annoyed with mandates and changes that bring pain points to our economy and our way of life. And when an economy tanks um, and food becomes scarce, this is when we will see a level of frustration that causes these things on an unprecedented scale. And we're starting to see the trend towards this state. Uh, verse 17, a man shall desire to go into a city and shall not be able. So here we get hints that because of the rioting, the destruction, the chaos, your ability just to move from city to city won't even be possible. I mean, think of looting and destruction, chaos, where the streets are literally blocked and barricaded. This is a complete collapse of a society. I don't think you're going to your job or to work at this time. I think you're just trying to survive. Everything has collapsed here. So um, um, this is not just here in America. This is on a global scale. So. Verse 18, for because of their pride, the cities shall be troubled. The houses shall be destroyed and men shall be afraid. Ah, this is heavy, guys. Um, pride is mentioned as one of the causes of this breakdown. Pride prevents us from listening or learning or considering another's perspective. Man, we don't listen to facts. If we're so, when we're so emotionally compromised and hold to one opinion, we are so unwilling to see another perspective now. I mean, look at California, their living conditions. I was just there for the Rose Bowl. And uh, the, you know, some of the stuff I saw there is crazy. It's like, how, how is this happening? Um, when you see the unwillingness for them to change these things and improve these conditions, instead what we're seeing is, laws and policies and rhetoric that promote pandemonium and chaos. So in this state, there's a level of fear and a very great um, 
um, fear takes place. Um, but just remember, the faithful are fearless. The fearful are faithless. So the wicked will be fearful, but they will also be the cause of everyone's fear. All right, verse 19. A man shall have no pity upon his neighbor but shall destroy their houses with the sword and spoil their goods because of the lack of bread and for great tribulation. Guys, this is heavy. This is hard to read. One of the biggest hints as to why there's so much chaos found in this verse and for the reason of it, of why they spoil their goods is because of the lack of bread. Now, this is just hearsay, but I heard a story of Sister Nelson when she was getting her hair done. A young lady was in there next to her getting her hair done, and the prophet, President Nelson, was outside in the car. And she got up the nerve to ask Sister Nelson, what advice would your husband give me? And Sister Nelson chimed in and says, oh, he used to give a lot of advice. He used to give this advice and give that advice, but lately... He just tells everybody the same thing. And he says, line your walls with food. And I think when you look at images of the grocery stores and when you see increasing chaos and when you see inflation going through the roof and an economy about to teeter into collapse, um, I still think that's a little ways off. But you can... You can feel confident if you've got some food storage. I mean, skip the vacation and buy some food storage. Skip some of the frivolous things you spend your money on and, and have some temporal preparedness, please. It will bless you. Oh, but you're a prepper and a doomsdayer. Look, we've been counseled for a long time to be prepped and, and ready and prepared. It's not, it's not insane to have a level of preparation. And frankly, I think the more you have, the better. I mean, you don't have to go, uh, the extreme survivalism has been warned against. We're not digging bunkers and storing guns and bullets because that's not what we're gonna be doing during this time. We're gonna be humble and submissive and doing the Lord's work and preaching and prophesying to others and helping the beleaguered among us. We're gonna be the warning voice. Well, you know, this is, this is a mission that we have been given, and it's a privileged mission, and it's exciting what, what's uh, to come, how we're going to be able to um, bring about the missionary work and conversion of many others when they're forcibly humbled. All right, next slide. Okay, verse 20. Behold, saith God, I will call together all the kings of the earth to reverence me, which are from the rising of the sun, from the south, from the east, and Libanus to turn themselves one against another and repay the thing that they have done unto them. So the verbiage of calling all the kings to reverence me, this sounds a lot like the final second coming where every nation shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Christ. But there is more here. I feel these verses are applicable to all the wicked over the earth. And the Lord is basically giving them his warning. But in this case, it may be describing more of a regional destruction. So when we look at Libanus, that is an ancient name for Mount Lebanon or the Lebanon Mountains. And I've put a map over here in the top right corner that you can reference to it. So Lebanon is found just north of Israel and next to Syria. So I interpret reverence me here as being what I call forcibly humbled. Um, they will be brought down into the depths of humility when they're about to face their destruction. Basically, they will get what they deserve for what they have done unto them, them being the saints. So it's also references them turning against one another and fighting with each other. So this is one of the ways the Lord punishes wicked. When you read here um, that it repays the thing which they have done, and it says here to turn themselves one against another in uh, verse 20, um, you're seeing this Middle East infighting 
of the wicked among the wicked kings start to begin. I mean, it has begun. We've been seeing ISIS and Afghanistan. We've, we've been seeing these guys fight already, but it'll be on a much greater scale. Verse 21, like as they do yet this day unto my chosen, so will I do also to them and recompense in their bosom, thus saith the Lord God. So the Lord is just basically says, they are going to get what they deserve. They will be repaid for their abuse of the faithful, proven elect of Christ. Verse 22, my right hand shall not spare the sinners and my sword shall not cease over them that shed innocent blood upon the earth. So when these judgments come, they will not stop. There will be no reprieve. There will be no time out. This will continue until their final end. We are seeing uh, some of this. Um, verse uh, 23, the fire has gone forth from his wrath and hath consumed the foundations of the earth and the sinners like the straw that is kindled. So again, the Lord is referencing the burning of straw, which is highly inflammatory. And I put a picture here. If you've ever seen a grass fire, there's nothing you can do but run from it. it you can't stop. There's no amount of equipment or anything that really can put out a raging grass fire when it's blown in the winds. Look at the Colorado grass fire and how many houses it, it destroyed in the middle of the winter. So um, this, this fire um, that he talks about in this verse, this is his last and final act of cleansing the entire earth. Even though there have been, and there will be several previous cleansings and fires, this one is final. Um, so he's talking about the finality right here. In verse 24, woe unto them that sin and keep not become my commandments, saith the Lord. So again, references the sinners. These are people who, that have uh, committed not just personal transgressions and sins, but sin against the elect of God, sin of taking away agency, taking away freedom. So they are dirty and full of hatred and malice and contempt towards the righteous. They have now become accountable for their abuses. So I believe it was Richard G. Scott that said that the Lord looks at our sins and our challenges that we struggle with, our personal challenges. He looks at those with mercy. But he looks at rebellion with justice. And these sinners are in a state of sinful rebellion. So they will be met with justice. But we, in our personal struggles, as long as we are trying to do the right thing, we're going to be given the full effects of the atonement and shown complete mercy. It doesn't matter how many times you make mistakes. Just as long as you don't turn and rebel and attack and persecute somebody else during this crucible period. All right, so verse 25, 26. I will not spare them. Go your way, ye, ye children, from the power. Defile not my sanctuary. For the Lord knoweth all them that sin against him. And therefore deliver he, unto, uh, he them unto death and destruction. All right, so these sinners are not spared. They lose their power to continue to sin against the Lord's elect. And they are no longer allowed to defile his sanctuary. Remember, the abomination that makes desolate is when the Antichrist enters into our temple and declares himself God. This abomination is the trigger for the desolation that is about to come. So um, basically this, this is the last straw of the Lord. And it is when he has had enough, he will no longer state his hand. So the Lord knows the wicked when he comes. They have the mark of the beast. Um, they do not have the seal of God in their foreheads. They are openly rebellious sinners and they cannot hide their actions. It is recorded, it is perceived and viewed and discerned, and it stands as a testimony against them and it results in their total destruction. The Lord has given warning. 
How many times and how many prophets has he showed this exact same vision? Um, but we know the wicked probably won't read this. And the day of judgment, the come to Jesus moment, um, will take them as a thief in the night. And then they will recognize their folly. All right, verse 27. For now are the plagues come upon the whole earth, and ye shall remain in them. For God shall not deliver you because ye have sinned against him. So when the plagues come, guys, they won't stop. We are seeing the plagues. We are seeing the beginning of sorrows, period. Um, these plagues are now intensifying. And throughout all scripture, the Lord has given warning to the wicked. He has told them in books. He has given modern day prophets to tell them. He has made them accountable for their actions. And he will use us to fulfill their accountability as we stand up for truth and righteousness in our trial period to come. He will be calling upon the saints to open their mouths, to highlight the abuses, but to take it submissively even at the cost of their own lives in order to give this full accountability for the actions of the wicked. So we need to be prepared to stand uh, to defend the Savior. We need to be prepared to stand in holy places. Look, we're not all going to die. I mean, that would defeat the point, you know. But Joseph Smith had to die, and certain church leaders had to die as a testimony um, all throughout history, Abinadi and others. So, um, next slide here. All right, verse 28. Behold, an horrible vision and the appearance thereof from the east. So, verse 28 starts with an incredible de event described as a horrible vision coming from the east. This is a vision of war and pending destruction, okay? Um, I want you to just take note of the word behold, and I will explain how that differentiates these visions later in this chapter. Verse 29, it says, where the nations of the dragons of Arabia shall come out with many chariots, and the multitude of them shall be carried as the wind upon earth, that all they which hear them may fear and tremble. So, okay, it's talking about the dragons of Arabia. I lived right here. You can see this map of the Middle East. I lived uh, about two hours north of Saudi Arabia for a while on a deployment there. Um, we might assume that the dragons of Arabia, well, it's Saudi Arabia, who are the dragons of Arabia described here. However, this would be a narrow focus. This is actually meant to be Arab nations together in unison joining for a final jihad. And this is the region that they're at. So it's more likely referring to this Arabian Peninsula where many of these nations have gathered. Their chariots represent all their modern day weapons of war. And when it says they are carried as the wind, that's meaning that they move with great speed. It's just a fast approach. Um, and it even could hint towards aircraft and airplanes and other stuff as well. So when it mentions all that hear, it doesn't say see them. It says all that hear them fear and tremble. This is hinting to the noise created by, by these modern day planes and tanks and trucks, maybe missiles, explosions, bullets. I don't know what it is. I mean, I just imagine this destructive force uh, mustering together um, and moving. Verse 30 says, also the, the Carmanians raging in wrath shall go forth as the wild boars of the woods and with great power shall they come and join battle with them, meaning the dragons of Arabia, and shall waste a portion of the land of the Assyrians. So um, when it talks about the uh, Carmanians, this is referring to the people in the Iran, Iraq area, kind of north of the uh, 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 Persian Gulf. And so as we can see, these countries are to the east of Syria. And Israel, basically, this is a big clue as to where they are gathering from. 
and toward whom they are gathering. Remember the hatred that they have for the Jews. I mean, they're taught this at age, you know, two or three. This will be all nations gathering against the Jews, literally. So from previous presentations I did, we learned that the Antichrist is involved here and somehow has caused them to war uh, against Israel and its two protective prophets who have been there for about three and a half years defending Israel. Um, it's probably that the third temple has been built, which could trigger, the, trigger this final straw, this hatred. So it says their ferocity is described as a wild boar. I put a picture of a wild boar up, up top. Uh, boars have killed many people. <laughs> they, they are ferocious. If you've ever seen a wild boar ambush or attack a person, it is lightning fast. It is ferocious. They, they have a fight or flight response. They either turn and run or they turn right towards you and fight. And that's a defense and a protective mechanism. And it is relentless. So um, this description, they're like a wild boar. That should give you a hint of the nature of the uh, Carmanians just going forth and just destroying as they move towards um, uh, Syria. Um, uh, so basically, it says they have great power and join with Arab nations and they lay waste some of the lands of Syria. So most likely, they're the ones that completely level the city of Damascus as, as is prophesied. This city of Damascus in Syria is going to be completely laid to waste. Um, verse 31. And then shall the dragons have the upper hand, remembering their nature, and and if they shall turn themselves, conspiring together in great power to persecute them. All right, so this is basically a strategic advancement. And it gives this warring party the upper hand and some control over the covenant people of Israel. So they've kind of moved here to this land of Assyria, uh, Syria, and they're on the doorstep of Israel. Um, verse, uh, verse 32. Then these shall be troubled, bled, and keep their silence through their power, and shall flee. So basically, some of these converted Christian Muslims and others have to flee for their lives. Verse 33, and from the land of the Assyrians shall the enemy besiege them, meaning Israel, and consume some of them. And in their host shall be fear and dread and strife among their kings. So remember, uh, earlier we learned that these kings were kind of warring a little bit, and now there's lack of unity again. So Basically, this warring party is now in Syria. This is from where they start to besiege Israel. Um, the, three, the two prophets are there defending them. Um, but they've had some success in killing and destroying some of them. Um, so it says their host is feared and, and there's dread. And it means they're very frightful uh, to their targeted opponent. Um, it also mentions here that there's contention argument, as I mentioned earlier, among the several leaders of these warring nations. Remember, these are all the Arab nations, and they were they were starting to have some warring and contention and infighting. But then they grouped together with a, a, a similar cause to go against Israel because now they got these two prophets defending them and and causing issues and now they're building a temple in this dome of the rock area which is just a lightning rod for contention something has happened here so we can see kind of how these events are um, unfolding so that's that vision now here verse 34 it says behold clouds from the east and from the north unto the south and they are very horrible to look upon full of wrath and storm all right, so if you look back at verse 28, it started with, Behold, a horrible vision. Now we begin verse 34, and it seems to start off with a completely new vision when it says, Behold, clouds from the east. So even if you look back at verse 20, 
it starts with behold, and then it describes that first regional conflict we talked about. So as I understand it, I may be out on a limb here, but it, and it can be hard to perceive these things, but these are different visions. So the language of behold is the key for distinguishing the first vision from the second and the third. So let's just keep that in mind that there are two general locations of the Lord's elect. There's Jerusalem and America where end time visions have been seen and described. So they, they see America and they describe it in a vision and prophets see Jerusalem and they describe it in a vision. And so many prophets have seen the same thing and written the accounts. Um, furthermore, if you recall in verse 10, when the Lord uh, refers to Egypt, but it's meaning modern day peoples in that region that are similar to the wicked Egyptians of old. Then you hear the Lord talk about Babylon. And there are many scriptures that talk about Babylon of old being full of iniquity. But this is a modern day Babylon. These are a wicked people and not an actual ancient city of Babylon. So it is my opinion that the Lord refers to Egypt and Babylon similarly to signify the wickedness of the people of the last days. But what differentiates them is their geographic location. So one of the biggest hints that will come in the first verse of the following chapter, which is Ezra chapter 16, verse 1, it says this, Woe be unto thee, Babylon and Asia. Woe be unto thee, Egypt and Syria. This is clearly distinguishing for separate geographies. But if you think of Egypt and Syria, they're very close. They can actually be considered, you know, from that one location. So we're soon going to learn later that in this chapter about what happens to Asia, it's the last vision of this. But what I've basically concluded and the impressions I got when reading this prophecy is that when using the term Babylon, it is referring to the wicked in America. And when referring to Egypt and Syria, the Assyrian, the Antichrist, also known as that, this is referring to the wicked people of that region. Remember, when I talked about previous presentation, the Antichrist being the Assyrian, and that referenced the wicked Assyrian king, but is actually referencing, referring to the modern day Antichrist when he's at that location. So, just remember, when we talk about the Antichrist, he first comes to America, Babylon, then he flees from America to what we are about to read in this next vision. And that's what I believe is causing him to flee Europe. All right, so I, I got a little sidetracked there, but this vision starts off with clouds from the east and the north in verse 34. The North gives a potential hint to who or what this is. What is this cloud? What is its purpose? Well, we're about to see another piece of the puzzle to numerous collaborative prophecies. I'm just going to give you my spoiler alert. Just to preface my opinion, I see these clouds as being the sounding of the fifth and sixth trumpet. This is the army of 200 million which originate from the lost 10 tribes that were hidden in the north. And they are coming to the rescue of the saints and to the destruction of the Babylonic people of America who have been persecuting the saints along with this terrible Antichrist. So it says these clouds are full of wrath and storm. This is the wrath of God. Why? Is God angry? What made God angry? Well, the persecution and ultimately the abomination of the Antichrist when he enters the temple of God. This abomination that makes desolate, this is what makes it desolate. Well, how does wicked Babylonian America become desolate? It's by the means of this cloud of wrath 
or in other words, an army of 200 million righteous Lost Ten Tribes members with modern advanced technology which seems to fill the sky and look like smoke, not from the earth, not from the ocean, the smoke is in the sky. Um, so many references in other prophets coming out of the sky and from heaven. We'll get into that. But let me just give you another account. I have resisted sharing the several different visions of accounts of this same event. But it's hard to resist because you're thinking, how do you deduce this, John? Well, how do you, uh, you know, come up with these? You know, it's when you study all the uh, words of the prophets of the same account. So let's just give you uh, the same vision that was from Ezekiel as we continue with this one. Ezekiel chapter 1 verses 4 through 6. And I looked and behold a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself. And a brightness was about it. Whoa! Righteous people and angels, the brightness about it. And out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber. God, this is like a, the sun and, or something. And out of the midst of the fire. So, I mean, I, it's hard to imagine what this is describing here to me. Also, out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of of man now look as you, i'm not going to read all this but as you continue to read this go right now pause this go here and read the rest of this account and as you continue to read you're going to learn from the symbolic hints that this is the lost 10 tribes which are the smoke and seem to be in some type of advanced ships that are described read it for yourselves are these possibly the ships of chittim as mentioned in Daniel, and as I discussed in my previous presentations, I believe so. Um, I can't help myself because some people are going to go, oh, this is too much. Okay, let's look at Isaiah. I put it over here. There's a few clues to Isaiah. You should do this yourselves. Look at all these different prophets' visions and marry up the America vision, the Lost Ten Tribes' visions. And you're going to learn a ton about the nature of this uh, rescue. So in Isaiah, it says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. The Assyrian is the Antichrist. It's, it's another name for the Antichrist. Wormwood, the mouth, the stout horn, the Assyrian. So many prophets have seen this Antichrist and, and named him. And, and so Isaiah just says, Be not afraid of the Antichrist we're we're not to fear him he shall smite thee with a rod and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of egypt so here referencing the children in bondage in egypt and what happens to these children this awesome exodus happens that is a type and shadow of what's going to happen with us only the lost ten tribes returning is on a scale far beyond spectacular more spectacular than the exodus of egypt all right so verse 25 for um yet a very little while and the indignation shall cease and mine anger in their destruction so we're gonna be persecuted a little bit here but then and it's just gonna be for a little while but then it's gonna stop verse 26 and the lord of hosts shall stir up a scourge for him meaning the antichrist and all his those he persuaded a scourge of for him according to the slaughter of midian at the rock of oreb so the slaughter of midian if if you remember this is when the little teeny israel israeli people went in and slaughtered these giants that were as tall as a cedar tree i mean it, it's pretty amazing and then it says, and his rod was upon the sea, so so he lifted lifted it up after the manner of Egypt. So now it's referencing Moses going and parting the sea and delivering it and rescuing the Egyptians. So it's referencing a slaughter of the wicked and a rescue of the righteous. The exact same thing is going to happen in America. That's what this is talking about. So Isaiah 31, 8. 
Then shall the Assyrian, the Antichrist, fall with the sword, meaning his influence and a lot of his people. Not, and now here's a big clue right here. I love this. Not of a mighty man and the sword, not of a mean man shall devour him. So we're not talking about like when, you know, the the slaughter of Midian at the Rock of Oreb. We're not talking about giants killing giants. We're not talking about, we're talking about angels. We're talking about righteous people. We're talking about John, the beloved, whose mission it is to lead them in here and who, when he swallowed it, was sweet to the mouth, but then it became bitter in the belly, which means, oh, this is a hard thing to do to have to destroy the children of God because of their wickedness. But this is a task. And that is exactly what this is talking about. And so now it says, but he, meaning the Antichrist, shall flee from the sword and his young man shall be discomfited. So remember, the Antichrist has influenced the whole world. They wonder after the beast and he does miracles and he, he, he gains power by flattery and he is so convincing beyond what anybody has ever seen. This Antichrist is unlike any Antichrist that there has ever been. So people are persecuting us along with the Antichrist. And now it says his young men, these people that he has influenced, they are very discomfited. They are very vulnerable. They're like, oh boy, we are in trouble. Oh boy, we screwed up. Oh boy, we are now recognizing our folly. Please hide me in a cave and bury me under rocks. That's how they're feeling. So verse nine, so he shall pass over his strong, over to his stronghold for fear and his princes shall be afraid of the ensign, saith the Lord, whose fire is in Zion and his furnace in Jerusalem. Two locations. But it says, I love it when it says he passes over from to his stronghold for fear. He flees America and he goes to Europe and Asia, his stronghold, because he's afraid. And, um, and uh, his princes, all his followers, are afraid of what just showed up. <laughs> So anyway, I, I'm resisting going into all the other accounts, but I hope that's enough to show you that this vision is talking about America. Let's move on. All right, so we barely got through verse 34, but um, let's read it again. Verse 44, behold clouds from the east and from the north unto the south, and they are very horrible to look upon, full of wrath and storm. Verse 35, they shall smite one upon another, and they shall smite down a great multitude of stars upon the earth, even their own star. And blood shall be from the sword unto the belly and dung of men unto the camel's hoe. All right, so now that we've kind of established what or who I believe this is and why, let's dissect it. They're casting stars upon the earth. I don't know if these are bullets. Anytime they say stars, or the great star, I think of, you know, the seven stars or the seven angels or the seven trumpets, you know, so there's some symbology here that, you know, that you need to study for yourselves. But, you know, casting to earth, are these casting bullets or whatever this advanced technology they have? So verse 35, 36 are a little bit hard to discern, but I speculate Smiting down a great multitude of stars could be the destruction of many people or maybe a hail of bullets in this destruction or some form of weapon that destroys. When it says blood shall be from the sword unto the belly. To me, the image I have is when you think of a sword stabbing somebody in the belly, this is, and then it shows blood on the sword. This is a uh, symbolic of a very slow, painful death. It's kind of a torment. Maybe it's a torment of five months. Um, I don't know, but it, it's symbolic of a slow, painful death. When it says, and dung of men unto the camel's hoe, this is 
when men are destroyed and wasted, well, I mean, think of America and all the wicked are destroyed and it's cleansed and prepared to build the new Jerusalem and receive the Lord and become covenant America now in the city of Enoch, whatever. America is cleansed. Think of all the dead bodies laying around, rotting, and camels and whatever, you know, walking over them. That's kind of the imagery I have. It's symbolic of dead and wasted bodies rotting on the ground and trampled on. That's kind of what I got from that. Verse 37, and there shall be great fearfulness and trembling upon earth. And they that see the wrath shall be afraid and trembling shall come upon them. So um, when it says great fearfulness and trembling upon the earth, meaning the whole earth, they've either heard or witnessed it. And it took everybody by surprise. They were happily following the Antichrist. And all of a sudden, oh, we screwed up. This event we are discussing, in my mind, is the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Uh, and you can read that in a lot of different scriptures. When they see that wrath, they are afraid. So why do men fear when the clear judgments of God come? Well, <laughs> it's because they know what they have been doing has been wicked and satanic, and they are about to recognize their folly. All right, verse 38. And then uh, there uh, come great storms from the south and from the north, and another part from the west. Oh my gosh, okay, so we're seeing storms from every direction. And so as we have now established, this is an army of destruction, okay? And in verse 39, it says, And strong winds shall arise from the east and shall open it. And the cloud which he raised up in wrath and the star stirred, star again, stirred to cause fear towards the east and the west shall be destroyed. All right, so um, let's start off here. There's a couple things I, I want to clarify here. Strong winds open something, all right? I wonder if this is referring to the keys of the bottomless pit. The cloud of wrath and the star that caused fear shall be destroyed. I personally believe this is a slight misinterpretation. The star in my mind is possibly John the Revelator. And remember that John was given this mission that when, um, and when this, when he symbolically ate this mission, it was sweet to the taste, and then it was bitter in the belly. Belly, so he was thrilled to be the rescuer of us, leading the lost ten tribes. But he was pained to have to be the one that destroys the wicked and the antichrist and their power and influence and their hurtful claws, as we've learned in previous presentations. So they will have no more influence, no more hurt, no more pain, no more persecution. So this great day is a great day for the saints. And this terrible day is a terrible day for the wicked. The great and terrible day of the Lord. Hence is why it's so named. So that is confusing. The star that caused fear shall be destroyed. I think it's the, the star um, that they fear shall destroy them. Um, all right, verse 40, a great and mighty cloud shall be puffed up full of wrath and the star. So that's why I, I, I refer to this more that they may make all the earth afraid. It's not the wicked people making the earth afraid now, guys, it's the star. So it's the star's not killed. That's why I'm saying that. And then that dwell therein and they shall pour out every high and eminent place a horrible star <laughs> we're getting a lot of references to the star you know seven stars seven angels seven trumpets um so verse 40 it continues to describe this magnificent scene puff up clouds smoke full of wrath a great star john the beloved they put the fear of god into the whole world the wicked of the world are now on notice. They are described, they meaning the righteous lost in tribes and with John, 
they are described as pouring out of every high place. And then it mentions the star again. So, uh, you know, I also wonder, is this star like some type of planet or a ship that's arrived? Bottom line, what this scene is will rival the re exodus of Egypt in its wonder and might. This is going to be talked about for eternity. Verse 41 Fire and hell and flying swords, that sounds like bullets, and many waters. Remember, waters is people. We'll get into that. And all fields may be full, and all rivers, and the abundance of great waters. So when you, when I, when you think of fire and hell and flying swords, I think of bullets and many waters. Remember, we learned in previous presentations and other areas that waters refers to a numerous host of people. Which people? Well, the, the lost 10 tribes here. And it describes the imagery of these waters or these people are described like a flood and they're overflowing the fields and the rivers. They're going over everywhere. <laughs> um, this is a house cleansing. America will be completely wiped out and destroyed when it's wicked. We've seen the history of America in the Book of Mormon. You're wicked. I destroy you all because America will belong to Christ and they will worship the Christ. And now that Christ is coming to literally dwell here in America and the Lord, America has to be cleansed. So this is a flood of destructive peoples flowing down everywhere with fire and flying swords and wrath and this huge star in the sky, I guess. Um, this is an amazing event. <laughs> read, you need to read other accounts to get some clues into what this event is, especially Ezekiel, as I mentioned earlier. Verse 42, um, and they shall break down the cities and walls, mountains and hills, trees of the woods, and grass of the meadows and their corn. Um, what does this blood, flood do? That's what it does. I mean, it, it's everywhere. Nothing is spared or safe. Verse 43, they shall go steadfastly unto Babylon. Remember, Babylon is, are we talking about the ancient city of Babylon, the wicked city? No, we were talking about the modern day wicked people of Babylon and, they're, and make her afraid. They're gonna make Babylon afraid. So they go steadfastly to Babylon, which is what I previously established as wicked America and make her afraid. Verse 44, they shall come to her and besiege her, the star, John, and all wrath shall they pour out upon her, Babylon, America, the wicked in America. Then shall the dust and smoke go up unto heaven, and all they that be about her shall bewail her. So basically America becomes burnt. All the horror of Babylon and the... They that got rich and powerful off America and prosper and her prosperity, they bemoan, they bewail her because now they have nothing. They were able to, you know, take so much money and, you know, the secret combinations. If we, you only open your eyes and see, you know, um, what they're doing and how they're just taking money and taxes and all this. I mean, it's crazy. Anyway. Um, 45, and they that remain under her shall do service unto them that have put her in fear. So basically, those that remain, remember, the wicked are destroyed. Who remains? Hopefully it's us, the righteous. So those that remain serve those that came and put America in fear in the first place. So this is actually talking about the righteous children of Ephraim giving the temple ordinances to the righteous lost ten tribes who have just rescued the children of Ephraim, us. Remember, we fall upon their necks. We are one people. We are Zion. And America is cleansed. And we are happy to be rescued from this terrible Antichrist. The Lord's covenant with America, all his promises, are, have just been fulfilled. So um, this is uh, this is incredible 
this little snippet, but when you tie it into other prophets, it's just amazing, um, all these visions. All right, the last vision, um, and we're just going to go through a lot. And it says, And thou, Asia, that art partaker of the hope of Babylon, which is, we've now established, that's America, and art the glory of her person. We're talking about, this is about to talk about Asia and China, you know, these guys. And they sure did try and become like Babylon, didn't they? They sure did try and model after America. We're going to read very specifically how it is. Um, just remember, <clears throat> the remainder of this vision is being directed towards Asia and China. China is a partaker of the hope of Babylon. They used America. They modeled themselves after the Babylonian America. They corrupted themselves. They basically tried to be like Babylon. Um, they are the reason I believe that Babylon refers uh, to wicked America. This gives you hints as to, I mean, China is trying to be like Babylon. And so this gives you hints why I, I believe this is America. It says, thou hast made thyself like her. Thou has followed her. So that should be the big hint. We'll read that in a second here. So verse 40, 47, woe be unto thee. This is Asia. This is China. Thou wretch, because thou hast made thyself like unto her. Thou hast decked thy daughters in whoredoms. Yeah. Um, that they might please and glory in thy lovers, which have always desired to commit whoredoms with thee. So there's some immorality going on here in Babylon. And China's want to be Babylon, I guess you could call it. Thou hast followed her. This is Asia following her, Babylon. Thou hast followed her that is hated in all her works and inventions. Therefore saith God, I will send plagues upon thee, widowhood, poverty, famine, sword, and pestilence, to waste thy houses with destruction and death. Okay, so if you're righteous, you're not afraid of this. There are lots of Christians over there. If you're wicked, you probably are going to be scared to death of this. All right, verse 50. And the glory of thy power shall be dried up as a flower. The heat shall arise that is sent over thee. So their power and their glory and their economy and their money and their military might and all, it's just going to dry up. Lord is going to dry them up. And 50, it says there's possibly like a heat wave or an actual fiery destruction. It just kind of gives a hint when it says heat. Verse 51, thou shalt be weakened as a poor woman with stripes and as one chastised with wounds so that the mighty and lovers shall not be able to receive thee. Um, verse 42, would I with jealousy so have proceeded against thee, saith the Lord, if thou hadst not always slain my chosen? Okay, they are killing uh, Christians exalting the stroke of thy hand and saying over their dread when thou wast drunken, which usually refers to full of wickedness and hatred. Set forth the beauty of thy countenance. So that's one big question, those three, the three verses. Uh, basically, China has apparently persecuted and killed their Christians. And the Lord's asking them a question, would I have done all this to you if, if you hadn't done all this horrible stuff to my my elect and chosen. All right. So now he says, 55, the reward of thy whoredom shall be in thy bosom. Therefore, thou shalt receive recompense. You're going to get what you deserve. Verse 56, like as thou hast done unto my chosen, saith the Lord, even so shall God do unto thee and shall deliver thee into mischief. So you're going to get what you deserve again. Um, Thy children shall die of hunger, and thou shalt fall through the sword. There's a little bit of civil war going there. You're going to kill each other. You're going to fall through the sword, um, which usually mean, it could insinuate your, yourself, you know, killing. It's kind of an honor killing over there in those countries. 
Thy city shall be broken down, and all thine shall perish with the sword in the field. All right, so it's just, it's not fun um, what happens to the wicked over here. They that be in the mountains shall die of hunger and shall eat their own flesh. Ah, this is hard, but cannibalism happens, especially in times of absolute desperation and hunger. And, um, and it says here, and drink their own blood for the very hunger of bread and thirst of water. So um, when your heart is turned hard and you're absolutely wicked and corrupt, you will go to those lengths. Uh, verse 59, thou as an un, as unhappy shalt come through the sea and receive plagues again. Okay, we're talking about something coming across the sea to China and causing plagues again. What is this something? This is something I, I want to study a little bit more. But it says, and in the passage, they... I think it's the lost 10 tribes from America. They shall rush on the idle city, which is China and Asia and all those, and shall destroy some portion of thy land and consume part of thy glory and shall return to Babylon that was destroyed. This is why I think it's the lost 10 tribes because it says Babylon, which is America, and Babylon was destroyed by the lost 10 tribes. So it just seems like to me... They, can't, they go over to um, Asia and destroy part of that or whatever and then come back. And then verse 61, And thou shalt be cast down by them as stubble, and they shall be unto thee as fire. So it's very similar. They're, they're burning the wicked. Um, and it's very similar to what happened in America. They shall consume thee and thy cities and thy land and thy mountains and all thy woods and thy fruitful trees. Shall they burn up with fire? The whole place is burnt, <laughs> just like America. Thy children shall they carry away captive and, and look what thou hast. They shall spoil it and mar the beauty of thy face. So I don't see the lost in tribes uh, kidnapping their children or whatever. But I see the symbology and descriptiveness. Whether the Lord uses somebody else that's wicked, maybe it's the wicked that flee over to Asia and destroy some of it. Whether, you know, the God, the Lord punishes the wicked with the wicked. And as we see from the lost in tribes with sometimes the righteous. So when it, it seems that this army comes across and returns back to America, um, they shall be unto thee as fire. This force goes and burns China up in its wickedness. Okay, we already covered that. So, guys, this was, there is one more chapter. I'll do one more presentation. It's pretty incredible, too. But this, there was a lot of information here, like four different visions just in this chapter. If you look at the previous presentations and Ezra Eagle, you start to get some context just from Ezra, just from this chapter of, uh, you know, the sequence of events leading up to the great and dreadful day of the Lord and then the final ultimate second coming and the ushering in of the millennial reign here upon earth where, you know, um, we're all um, living in harmony together the morning of the first resurrection, etc. So I hope you enjoyed this um, uh, and uh, take care. We'll talk to you later.